Welcome back. This is the Peggy Smedley Show coming to you live from CES 2018. And I am welcoming me back. He's kind of becoming a regular, Daniel Cooley, who is the Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Internet of Things products at Silicon Labs. Daniel, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Peggy. I'm glad to be here. You know, you were with me last year, you're with me this year, mm -hmm. and we have a lot to talk about. So I think we we're do. just going to keep talking the whole afternoon. I don't know. We'll just see what we can talk about. We'll just keep going. What do you think? That sounds perfect. This is my life. So this is I your have a lot life. to say. So yeah. where, where do we want to begin? What do we want to talk about right now? Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things going on. So I'm in the Internet of Things kind of side of the world. We've got a lot of automotive and fun stuff behind us, but so, it's more command and control. So let's do this. First, tell our viewers and listeners who might not know what Silicon Labs is and what you do. Give an introduction of yourself. Uh, sure. So I'm Daniel. I run the IoT group at Silicon Labs. And what that really means is we're the ones building all the chips that are enabling all the things like smart home devices. So you think about how you control things with your phone or you control things through an app of some format. We're the chip behind that uh, in the thermostats, in the smoke detectors, in the smart coffee machines, in all of this door locks. That's, that's us making the chips that go in there. So we see the whole industry uh, in all geographies. So I just, before you came on, gave some numbers that have been out there, they're saying, but right now there's about 15% of our homes are connected and they're saying and predictions are by 2020, 100% of our homes will be connected. What does connected mean to you? I Well, this is what we were saying. The numbers that they were saying, and I'm not putting these numbers out, I guess the analysts do, and the analysts like to say anything. Yeah. I'm just not to pick on them, but they can say anything and nobody holds their feet to the fire. But they're saying smoke detectors and they're saying meters and they're saying appliances. Yep. And they've just said those things that we typically have, lights, those kind of things. So whether that's a garage door opener or whatever that is, is that going to be the case? Uh, I think so. I think probably the number of connected homes is even higher today. If you really think about the internet, the garage door opener that you have, if you have an alarm system in your house, I mean, these things are already wireless and they're already there. Now it's about tying it all together and creating yeah, more content. Now that's the problem. Yes. Tying it all together. Yes. We do not have interoperability and that's a whole nother mess. Yeah. But are we going to pick are we going to pick a winner? Are we going to say we are all Google, we are all Amazon, we are all Bixby, or we are all Cortana, or we are all I don't know Watson. I don't know what what's it going to be? I don't know who who is it going to be? I don't know who's going to be the AI winner of the day. I that's a really good question, Peggy. <laughs> I I can say this. Um, there is kind of a battle going on for that ownership of the home right now. Anybody who has a significant digital footprint in your house today is going after that. And in, it's, in, it's in all countries too. We focus in on the US here, but it's happening in China. It's happening in, in Europe. It's happening in India even. Um, so yes, you got the Googles, you got the Amazons, you got the Comcasts of the world, you got the security companies, you got anybody with a data pipe to your house right now and even get ready for the LTE carriers with 5G. They're going to be coming direct to the consumers as well. So anybody so with that is, is trying to really go hard. Is it really going to be just those three companies? Because I look at like a Samsung, they're pretty open. They're pretty open with what they want to do. They want to connect pretty much and partner with anyone. So I don't know if they're really in the big fight as Comcast, Amazon, and Google so much. Or are they going to get thrown into that battle now that they're kind of saying they want to connect everything? Are we talking about they're going to be in there? Or are they just one that says, look, we want to play nice with everyone? Um, Samsung is one of the more open ecosystems that's yeah. out there. I mean, you're right about that. And they participate in a lot of the standards bodies. Uh, they made an acquisition a few years back of Smart Things, which is a very open platform. It was defined as that. Um, you know, but they're, they're also not necessarily selling services into the home yet. Uh, they're selling mostly the goods that go in there. All the, the TVs, appliances. the appliances, the refrigerators, you know, these kind of things. Uh, so there's actually kind of a very big shift right now that we're seeing in the marketplace around you know, can you monetize in the long term selling devices and things? Or do you have to shift that to a services model of some kind? Or is there some hybrid in there? Um, and there's a lot of companies that are fighting for that purchase point as well. It's just something like, how do you make money in this space? If I order more soap detergent, I think Tide wants that. You know, they don't want to necessarily go through a different kind of store. So if they can have a mechanism to using IoT to get that purchase point, then they're going to go after that. So right now when we look, it's pretty clear that Google's made a statement that they're going to be aggressive for the home this coming year. I mean, it's pretty clear if you see them here, it's going to be a big fight in 2018 here for the home and, and we're going to see it. So what's that going to mean for the average consumer that says, hey, you know what? 
this is getting tough for us because it's not open and you know what and and apple i don't think apple's going to sit on the sidelines either you know i think they're going to say hey we realize people aren't going to be using their their phones anymore as much it's going to change they're going to have to kind of get into this dog fight a little bit and they're going to have to make some decisions here i think they're going to have to make some we're going to see something they're not going to be quiet so there's going to be some surprises. You're right. And so what does that mean for the person, the average consumer in, in, in the U.S.? Um, so first, like that first thing that you said, yes, people who have smart home assistants use their phone less. I think Steve, um, uh, Tim Cook came out and acknowledged this. People use their phones less when they have something to talk to. And right now in the Apple ecosystem, there's really not something you can talk to that's like the Echo or the, the Google Home Assistant. Um, so the... the you know, the uses of this electronics is changing, how people interact is changing. Um, I think that for the average person, it's gonna be a little tough. Um, you know, I'm in this space, I'm deep, I understand all these things, and even it's hard for me. Uh, and so there's, I think there's a battleground going on in 2018 because everybody wants to get in, and then they're gonna have to make it easier once that happens. And it's a lot of software that has to be written, and we're not talking about software on the smartphones, it's software on embedded devices, which is a different kind of software. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of standards bodies works that have to have to go on to enable this. So we can't get these standards guys to agree because they kind of dig their heels in and say, you know, it's like Zigbee and Wi-Fi. They've all kind of agreed on what they're doing on their own things, right? That's right. Those standards bodies. And we they, they've kind of dug in and said, this is us, this is us, and that's what you have, right? And they're they're very entrenched, right? So we're going to have the same thing when it comes to AIs in the home. Yep. I mean, it's very clear. So you're going to have to, as a consumer, say, I'm a Google fan or I'm an Amazon fan and that's what I am or I'm a Comcast or whatever it's going to be. Is that necessarily a bad thing? I don't actually believe that 100%. Okay. So Why? Is it, it, it would be a bad thing in my mind. So we work with people who want to make things for the most part think about your door lock or your appliance or garage door opener whatever it is and they're sitting here saying wow i have to make my thing i don't know if it's going to sell through an apple channel a comcast channel a security services channel i don't know so they're coming to people like us saying how do we play with all of these vendors because we don't know who's going to win either we don't know what standards are going to win and all that um so what we're what i believe this is just my own speculation i there is no fact behind it it's what i believe that the the AI that's kind of going on that's descending from Cloudland into on-premises gateways is going to get very smart. There's going to be a lot of translation that happens in that gateway. And then, you know, in two or three years, when devices wake up for the first time and you put that battery in and you press on, it connects to that gateway and says, what are you? And then the gateway will say, I'm an Apple gateway, I'm a Google, I'm a Samsung, Comcast, whatever it is. And then it will download software to it and tell it what it is. And then if you change your services, if I say, okay, I'm no longer just for practical purposes. I'm not a Google house. I'm an Apple house. You'll get the Apple gateway potentially and you press a button. It'll go out, find those devices. It'll refresh the software and then you'll, you'll be able to reuse these devices because people aren't going to change their door lock that often. Their light switches, their light bulbs, their water heater, what their air conditioning system, HVAC control, whatever these people aren't going to change these things. So there's going to have to be a mechanism to change what those things are. So do we have to get to a point where these companies say, or there's got to have to be someone who figures it out to make that gateway work. Everybody's I mean, trying to do this right now. There's a we've battle been doing of the gateway. We've Pardon been doing me? it for years, haven't we? Well, I think the difference now is uh, the gateways that the raw compute, first of all, Moore's Law is doing its thing. Um, the gateway manufacturers are realizing they need this IoT capabilities. For a long time, gateways. Your, your cable modem, your set-top box, whatever it is, was focused on just the content side. How to get Netflix faster to your TV. How to make sure that the person on the other side of the house has Wi-Fi connectivity on their iPad or their gaming system. They're all rapidly pulling in new chipsets, making new partnerships to do this kind of command and control, which is really what IoT is, style of networks. And then once they have that footprint, then they realize, okay, how do I maintain this long-term? How do I do the software updates and update security? No one wants that. Um, and so, you know, the difference now is that the raw compute's there, the back-end data centers are there, the infinite bandwidth essentially to the homes is there, and they can afford to make these investments. So, let's, let's, utopia, we get there. How long, 
how long will it take us to get to this utopia? Let's maybe that's the better question. Um, that's a really good question because I can bound it for you. Okay. It takes a certain amount of time for chip companies to make a chip. It takes a certain amount of time to get that software for that chip into production, and then it takes a certain amount of time to integrate it. And so you can say, is it going to happen in 2018, the utopia? Probably not. No. We're all building the chips right now for this utopian vision. Um, you know, so I believe it will be in the three-year time frame. Honestly, I think the data centers and the you know the Googles of the world will be ready before actually the end device manufacturers are ready because they typically move faster. End device manufacturers don't have time to put stop stop everything and redesign every system for the most security, the most software updatability. You know, they don't have software teams. They are you know, big iron, metal bending kind of organizations, and they're the ones that ultimately have to work with companies like Google um, in hundreds of applications. You guys have had to change a lot with comp in the market, in yep. the competition. Yep. How hard has it been for you guys as the market changes to compete now? Um, well, for Silicon Labs, that's, that's where I am, I and mean, I think you're referring to kind of some of the M&A in the industry. It's been a good thing for us. We're, we're hyper-focused on this, um, actually. And when, when you're seeing a lot of M&A going on in the industry, and typically around cost synergies, it throws our competitors' roadmaps out. You know, they don't necessarily, they don't have a solid story for the customers anymore. So it's been good for Silicon Labs. Overall, for semiconductors, this is a good thing as well because there's been a lot of investments made. 10 companies trying to make a Wi-Fi chip. 10 companies going after every single segment, and that's just not sustainable in the long run. How does it look when we talk about we go from an, from an analog to a digital world? How has that really changed what the market is and, and how you guys compete in generally? Um, well, that's kind of the roots of our company, but anybody who hasn't mastered at this point the right mix of analog and digital, which was the battleground 10 years ago, right. today the battleground is actually the right mix of hardware and software on these small devices. So our software teams are specking the hardware, actually, at this point. That's kind of what's going on right now. How do you have the best software architecture and then translate that down into hardware definition? And then you can have the lowest power, the best battery life, best performance, all those things that matter and ultimately enable all this IoT devices. And aren't we going to need that? Because when we talk about this, as, as everything gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you really have to look at what your capabilities are, right? Because that's really changing the dynamic of what you guys have to deliver to the marketplace for all of these new connected devices that you don't even know that are coming yet. That's right. Um, so how do you define a chip for an application that isn't even around right now? Right. You know, how do you do that? Actually, that's what we've done at Silicon Labs. Um, and how do you get the right mix of hardware and software and, and future upgradability versus cost today? Um, you know, I'll say that it's an art, not a science, and you can't necessarily go ask the customers because a lot of them aren't even around right now. We've taken a platform approach uh, where it's not hyper-optimized. We don't have different chips for a smoke detector and a door lock and all these other kind of things. And that's actually a key piece of our strategy, and I think a lot of other companies are realizing this, they have to do this now, but it takes time, it takes time to get there and to build this stuff. Um, I'm super excited, because we're actually, we're, we're kind of so deep in the supply chain, I can see what's coming for the next two years. Because they have to spec these things out, and then they have to start working with our chips, and it takes some time to work them into production and everything, and so there's a lot of fun stuff that's coming into the market. So talk about that. There are ideas that come to market that you, you know and you have to decide, is that going to be a good idea? Is it going to be viable? You know, the yeah. Oculus Rift that we always talk about, and we go, that is the major success story. But you come here and you see these new startups and you go, is that really going to be a winner? Or are we betting on a horse that's just not going to make it to the finish line? That's a really good topic because I'm ultimately I have to put my engineers behind this thing to make it successful or not. Um, you know, we, we, have, we see tremendous amounts of vision, I'll say. I mean, there is no lack of that going on in the industry right now, but we're always try to find the companies that have the vision and can actually execute on it and ship in the end. I don't win unless somebody actually ships a product in the end. They have to ship, and, and a lot of times we have to help them ship or they have to have the right channel, the right distribution model. It's simple stuff, actually, but a lot of the startups coming out think, if I make the best thing, that's enough. And it's like, it's not, that's right? not the case. In the IoT, if you don't understand things, you're not going to you're not going to be successful. And what I mean by things is manufacturing and shipping and channel and distribution and pricing models and, you know, all of these kind of old technology, you know, things. But everybody, a lot of people understand the technology piece, but not necessarily how to get their products into the market. And that's an interesting point because you have a lot of young people who have these great ideas. 
That's right. But they're not necessarily the best ones to actually execute on that company that they want to start. They That's don't right. understand that even though they want, they're, it's not ready to go to market yet. Yep. There's a whole lot more they have to do before they can bring it to market. That's There's right. a whole lot more development and things that have to be done before they can run. They've got to crawl before they can run. That's right, and a good example is the lock company Auto. So this is big in the press in the last few weeks, and they realized, I think at some point, that in order to, to kind of see their vision come to fruition, they needed to be a part of an organization that had factories and could ship and understand the, you know, how to get on the shelf at a store. The deal didn't go through, and um, that's kind of why it's in the press right now. I think a lot of hardware startups are realizing that maybe their home is better starting up inside of a bigger company, actually, but then that goes against a whole lot of grain of being independent and you know, our, a purity of the vision and not being pulled back by some red tape somewhere. So it, it's a real exciting time to be creating these companies because the, the raw underlying technology is just untapped in a lot of ways. There's so much you can do with this stuff. I mean, there's no lack of the vision. Like I said, there's no lack of vision. But I think there's a log jam in kind of getting to market. Do you build your device to plug into a Comcast system and an Amazon system and an Apple home system? Or are you building a worldwide product? Are you trying to plug into the Alibaba ecosystem or WeChat in China? And how do you do Orange and Deutsche Telekom in Europe? And you know, so the, the, the organizations that are kind of winning out there are the ones figuring out how to ship into all regions. Uh, and that's kind of where we step into because we make globally compliant chipsets for them and we enable them with software. And so we're starting to see which ones are going to be really big. I mean, when you start talking about the billions of units that the analysts are always talking about, that's when that thing really hits its stride. But is sometimes going to hit those billions of units sometimes a little overreaching? No. You, know, you think those are going to be the ones that are going to take off? I believe so. I'm betting my business on it right now and I'm working with the customers that literally have line of sight to that. I mean, there's not that many single applications that ship a billion units in the world. Cell phones, light bulbs, so you can imagine which ones I'm talking about here. But um, they're, the collective volume of devices going into homes, and then you extend that model into a hospital, a library, a train station, an airport, a university campus, whatever it is, it's all the same underlying technology in the end. So that's the key. When we look at this, it doesn't matter the vertical market. It matters the actual solution and what it can actually tap is the resources of information that it's gathering. That's right. Um, and every one of those kind of end segments that I just described have different needs, different use cases. Um, and there's a few companies coalescing and going hard after the home. But in every other segment, it's just not as visible. The same thing is happening. And so if you can create a kind of technology platform that feeds all of this stuff, your collective volume can keep the investments going and you can you know, get them to market. Uh, and there's different kind of ROI and business models out there. Um, like an example of this is asset tracking. Asset tracking in a factory or a container ship or the medicine in a hospital. I mean, the hospitals want to know where's the medicine cart at all times. And so if they can do this, they can get lower insurance premiums because there's less chance of theft and they know who was there and they know where it was. And so the business models all change. And so, you know, it's very exciting for me because we're seeding all this stuff and it, it, the home is the spearhead. Everybody has a home. Everybody goes inside their house and they turn a door lock and they, you know, use their computer and they watch TV. And every uh, one of those models is extending to a lot of different applications. You just don't see it. So we, we're talking about some of the, the abilities to grow, but what are some of the hurdles that hold back even the best entrepreneurs? I mean that, you know, we say sometimes they're not the best ones suited, but sometimes they're afraid to take that leap. Well, what are, what's... What's one of the things holding back? I'm, uh, Silicon Labs is very invested in standards bodies, so I gotta be careful here. Uh, standards progress at their own pace, and there has to be a lot of agreement. And there has to be a lot of different companies at the different layers that have to agree on what to do. Sometimes entrepreneurs say, I'm not going to play there. I'm just going to go create my own because it's better, faster, smaller, whatever it is. And then, you know, the interoperability. This is where the interoperability challenge comes on because they could come up with a better point solution. And then, but two years later, how does that point solution migrate back into the standards? And it becomes very challenging. So I think one of the biggest, you know, bottlenecks actually right now for entrepreneurs out there is how do they interface with the standards bodies or not? Um, and that's one of the biggest opportunities too, if you can strike that balance and you can kind of get your product to market. So just a, let me take it out of theory and put it into reality. Someone makes, wants to make a smart device, 
and they want to get to, sh to the market now. And they want to start shipping now. Well, they might ship it with a small gateway of some kind. Bluetooth to Wi-Fi, Zigbee to Wi-Fi, whatever they're using just to get back to their servers or their app. And then later on, they realize that they're going to have to pull that gateway out and connect to somebody else's gateway. Well, that may be a different data model, maybe a different connectivity standard. How do they do that effectively? If you can do that really well, now is a great time to go out and start these companies. If you don't know how to do that very well, I would start connecting with the standards bodies before you go off in your own direction because you're ultimately going to be out there by yourself. So. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So have you walked stands, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Has there been some technology out there that you go, why haven't these folks talked to me? Yes, uh, in some instances, I can't call out any names, but uh, I'm very excited about what I'm seeing. You know, a couple of years ago and a year ago, it was all about voice assistance and creating hubs and everything. I see a lot more people creating devices to connect to those hubs, which is really exciting. I, I walk on the floor and I ask people, some, some, some of them were in, some of them were not in, and I, and I ask them who they're using, what challenges they have. Um, so lots of proliferation of smart devices out there. It's really exciting. And the other thing is I'm starting to see more wireless power capabilities. Huge And, and I make ultra power. low power chipsets that could really benefit from this kind of technology. And I see everything from RF to infrared to inductive, you know, and it's still going to take some time for that even to get to market. But I'm starting to see technology I actually believe. I'm an engineer, so I, like, I have a, a fair, you know, uh, threshold for believability here. But I'm starting to see the, the beginnings of actual true wireless charging capabilities that, that industrial designers can pick up and actually use, that my customers would be able to use in their chipsets and their, in their end devices. And so that's really exciting for me. I just, I wasn't thinking it was even going to be here. And, and then there it is all over the show floor. And we're seeing a lot of that because a lot of people have figured out how they can do that. That's we right. we didn't see that before. That's right. Um, and, and there's some very practical challenges to wireless technology. If that thing is completely dead, right? How do, you, how, do you, how do you find it? How do you know what's out there? You know, and how does it start charging? Because these things are all beam forming all over the place. They're not just soaking you in right. watts of energy. They have to find the device and kind of target it. How do you do that? How do you do a software update to that thing? How do you manage it over time? Because IoT is really about two-way communication, not necessarily one way. And Meredith Perry at iBeam has really you know, bet her farm on trying to do that from that standpoint. Yeah. And, and, and you know, back into my semiconductor roots, I know how these chip companies are finally starting to enable the wireless technology too. And you have to, you know, you can't have a $10 wireless power module that's replacing a 99, doll, 99 cent coin cell battery. The, the, the market forces will never let that happen. So now they're finally bringing the cost point down to where it makes sense to do that. When you look at all these things here and you look at CES and uh -huh. you've been coming here, how many years now have you been coming here? Seven years. Seven years. Yeah. It gets bigger and bigger. Bigger and bigger. Nobody could ever walk this show and really no. know this show. It just gets so big. You have to kind of plot it out. When you look at connect to cars, smart cities, healthcare, when you try to decide for yourself, you know, at, at your company, how do you decide where you're going to go to really make some decisions here? I mean, are you able to do it? Uh, for longer, for long-term strategy, yeah. You know, and, and, and we're focused in on not the automotive space, we're focusing on almost everything else that you see here at the show, maybe not VR and AR. Uh, and so for longer term strategy, yeah, we can go out, we go out there and we look around, how are people adding value by connecting devices together? Like where is the, the, the Metcalf's law of network effect coming in? Who's got that vision out there? And there's a lot of companies trying to add connectivity, but it's not really IoT in some cases if it's just connecting to the phone and it's an extension of your phone. It's like the network effect. That's what I look for in a long-term strategy. So it, it, it's not a whole lot of companies doing that. It's easy to figure out which ones. But in many cases, the products that are on the show floor here were companies that we were talking to two years ago because that's how long it took them to build their product. So is there an industry here that you've seen as really making progress? Is it healthcare? Is it smart cities? Is it, you know, what what is really progressing that you say, I'm seeing products now that I didn't, that I see I am really liking, that are finally doing. We just talked about some, but you're saying it's finally coming that we thought should have been moving faster. Uh, wireless power is certainly one. We just talked about that, that's out there. I think that security, the security aspect of IoT um, like and tracking. Like in the home and tracking. Okay, so tracking. Security straight. and tracking solutions are, be are becoming widely accessible and deployable. Um, there's always been, it's always been there, 
I mean, the, the old days was somebody like with in the, tracking assets and things yeah, like that. Yeah, somebody with a clipboard writing okay. things down, you know. And now that migrated to barcode scanners, and then like we don't want to have somebody barcode scanning on the so then it became wireless. And so these things have been there, but they were only suitable. The cost was so high, and you had to, so many system integrators. You had to have a, a consultancy come in and help you do this. It was just that was the bar that was out there. Now the technology is getting so good and distributed that it's really accessible and to deploy in many many different kinds of applications. Transportation is another one where we're finally starting to see honest to goodness use cases that. In logistics and things like yeah, that as like well? Yeah, like farm to table, for example. Okay. You know, monitoring Ads the temperature and, and humidity of, of, of uh, and, the, and the source. People want to know where did my stuff come from? So there's an intense amount of security going into our chipsets to enable that kind of authenticity and traceability throughout the supply chain that people are starting to demand. Uh, maybe not the consumer starting to demand it, but maybe a retailer wants to know where their stuff so came Walmart from. So Walmart wants to know, wants to have a better understanding oh, yeah. and things like that. This is how they're going to market themselves and compete. We know where our stuff came from. You know, we know how much is local. We know how much, where it came from. We know that it's the real deal. And we know that it's not tainted or it's not, you know. That sourcing of all of that gives them greater insights into what they had before. That's right. Uh, and so that's great. Uh, I don't play in the space, but automotive is very exciting. There's been a lot of silicon that's been pouring into automotive for a long time. Uh, but now it's starting to kind of, I think, come to fruition. What about like waste management, that ability of tracking and, and distribution on things like that? Do you see some of that becoming more important as you're starting to look and things like that of being able to track, you know, where people are and being able to get movement and saying, tracking the ability to pickups and movement and those kind of things? Fleet management, yeah, that's a big application. There's a lot of companies out there trying to do that. I think any trucking service or anything like that right now that's not doing this kind of fleet management is is not going to be around in the long run. Um, any any asset that's on the move, maintenance, anything as, like any that. asset that's on the move. Yeah, we had a, a customer uh, who was making high-end coffee manufacturer, uh, coffee equipment, like in a Starbucks kind of a setting. And what they used to do was to find, design their products that last as long as possible. And they realized that if they had to go out and service the thing um, twice a year, there was it was a negative ROI. It was net, actually they lost money because these companies never buy them; they just lease them out. And so what they started doing was adding the kind of the model of okay, we're not going to build this thing just so it never breaks. That's very expensive to do. It takes forever. Every component super high end. We're going to break it so we're going to build it so that it's going to be serviced once a year, and we know it's going to be serviced once a year. And we're going to monitor the thing all the way through so we know exactly when to go in and they're, they're going to change out a bunch of components. And so their overall bomb was lower, their production cycle was simpler, it was lighter and everything like that. It wouldn't last as long in the long run, but it was more predictable. And because it was more predictable, they can make more money. And so we're seeing, you know, that's an IoT application. They're monitoring right. all this stuff, feeding it into some server somewhere and deciding when's it going to break. What would you like to see? What kind of solutions would you like to see that you still haven't seen? The user interfaces for everything are too hard. Um, you smile, but that's a really hard problem. It is. You know, the voice is is a natural extension, right? It's the one thing you don't have to go to school to learn to do. And so you I, still haven't mastered that no, yet. The voice still has a lot the of work. Voice yet. interface, you know, smartness about presence, and like how how do we as people interact with the technology? And I, and I think you're going to see some concepts coming out of very non-traditional spaces. I know you will, around how to do that. Companies that, that their whole life is the human interaction, the social media and element, and they're, they've, they've got a better understanding for how people want to use technology and what they want to do with it um, that, that somebody who's building physical devices just doesn't. So you're going to see some things coming there. But I think there's a whole lot to go in terms of the human element of all this stuff that you know, I don't know how, I'm not saying I know how to do it, I just, I'm identifying as something I want to see get better and better over time. Are we going to see that whole idea, people get a little nervous when we talk about AI and robotics and replacing and losing of jobs. Are we going to see a whole new generation of developers and engineers who are going to be able to create and develop that user interface that's going to say, yeah, you know, it's going to create new things, we're going to lose some things, but it's going to whole new generation of people who understand that user interface a little bit better and it's going to create new products and replace other products. I, I believe so. I mean, there is somewhat of an inflection point coming because you know, a, a, there's a potential with a lot of the AI and machine learning things for a lot of jobs to go away. And, and it's not just factory automation, it's legal industry, finance industry, uh, consulting Lawyers industries. are gone. <laughs> you know, you laugh, but, but 
you know, a lot of times you'll, you'll write a contract and you'll go to a law firm and say, will this contract hold up in court? And they, could, they, have one, they have two choices now. They could get their team of 12 attorneys to go research all these judges' artic, you know, opinions, or they can go to a machine learning algorithm that's just studied all these things, you just feed it all into the machine, and they'll both come back and they'll say, we think you're good or you know, we think you're not good. That's actually happening, happening right now. Right. So I think that there is an inflection point that's going to come. There's obviously new industries that are going to be created around this, uh, but it's, it's, it's a really interesting time to be in technology and kind of watch this unfold. And companies like NVIDIA and you know, who's here, um, Qualcomm, Intel, are kind of leading the charge in, in machine learning. And us in the semiconductor industry, we're, we're all watching them right now, like, what are they going to do? How is it going to go? It's going to be really interesting and disruptive, and it's going to be as, as, as disruptive, I think, as the internet was to publishing and all these other industries. I'll tell you, it's, it's an exciting time to be in it. You know, I love spending all this time with you, Daniel. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate me. it. Really appreciate it. All right. We are out of time as always. Things go by so fast. So if you want to tweet at us, tweet us at ConnectedWMag. And thanks for watching this segment again today. This is the Peggy Smedley Show, the podcasting voice of IoT and relevant technology. And remember, with great technology comes great responsibility. We'll be right back after this quick break. Welcome back to the Peggy Smedley Show. We are broadcasting live from the CES floor of 2018. And I know Daniel is still sticking around with us. This is Daniel Cooley. He is the Senior Vice President General Manager of the Internet of Things products at Silicon Labs. Daniel, thanks for sticking around. Oh, my pleasure. This is fun. So, Daniel, I know there were a couple things we didn't get to finish, and I was glad that you could stick around, but I really wanted to ask you a couple questions. One about the aging in place. I know we didn't get to talk about that. Let's talk about that really briefly. Sure. Uh, so, uh, there's a lot of IoT technology actually being deployed right now to allow what, what we call aging in place, uh, which is really about maintaining a sense of independence, I think, for people as they age and get a little older. Um, that, but you need a kind of core technology to enable that. Um, and so we're starting to see this. I personally am affected by this. Um, you know, last year, my mother-in-law, we came home and she had been on the floor for four oh, hours. And she just couldn't that. get up. Uh, no, but like I'm watching this go through. So there's wearable companies that are coming out around this technology. There's technologies around presence. There's technology about doing simple monitoring things. Did somebody get out of bed that day? So it, we got to strike a balance between privacy and security and actually being able to see that things are happening, but did someone open their refrigerator? I mean, simple things can tell you they're doing well or they're not doing well. We know that there is a huge population that is going to be that graying of America that we talk about. And are we doing enough for that population as we think about those products that you just talked about? You know, we don't want to say I've fallen and I can't get up. That's a trademark line, but that really is the case. You just described it, that we have to have those products that we know that the family loved ones that we have know that they're comfortable and that they can interact with that and that they're comfortable to know how to use those devices. You're right. And so the the kind of comfort with in engaging in this new technology can be somewhat of a, of a, of a divide. In many cases, uh, you know, people that are, you know, interfacing with Snapchat 24 hours a day aren't the people that necessarily need the aging in place. And so how do they feel comfortable interacting with this technology? Are the interfaces correct? Are the languages right? Can, is it loud enough? Can they see it? You know, all these kind of pieces that are out there. Um, that you know, a lot of companies are trying to solve right now. It's it's not quite as evident on a show floor like CES, but trust me, there are good organizations trying to solve this. Um, and there's a another big issue out here. It's just like in general, birth rates have declined. There's not as many kids around to help with the parents anymore. And so, in many cases, they're trying to stay connected to each other and their so own social groups in this process. And there's a lot of this aging in place that people are realizing is tied to general well-being of of, of mental health. That when you're when you're when you're happier, you're healthier. And it's not that you're healthier because you're happier, but you, when you're engaged, and the technology can help people stay engaged, because a lot of them could feel isolated otherwise. Isn't this this new thing we talk about in 2018? Is all about wellness. I mean, we're hearing yeah. a lot of this, and companies are investing in keeping their employees well. It's not only an older population, but it's even our younger, our population, whatever, about wellness right now. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a. I used when I grew up, I wanted to play in the NFL, and I realized a few years ago, like the number one performance enhancing thing they could do besides steroids and all that was like force their players to sleep. It was simple, and so they started making them wear sleep trackers. The rookies, I mean, 
the tenure veteran who's an all-star in the league, whatever, you can't do anything about that. But they made them wear sleep trackers. And if they weren't sleeping, they would, you know, the coaches and the medical staff would go talk to them. That whole concept is shifting also over into the well-being of, of uh, general workplace population. Are people healthy? Now, in our office, they started with simple things. They pulled out the vending machines and put in fruit. Okay, very, very simple stuff. But then how do you keep that progress going? Um, and so a lot of companies really care about this. They're putting more technology into the, into the workplace to enable that, uh, trying to strike the right, right life work balance. Because I think that output's no longer measured by you know, hours in the seat. And it's really about the output of the, of, of the employee to keep kind of the, the progress going. One thing that's near and dear to me, and I know it's near and dear to you, is the younger generation, keeping them educated, keeping them excited, keeping them involved in what we do in innovation. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's really interesting. There's a lot of, of, of media and the and press right now around how are things like social networking, you know, impacting the younger generation. Um, we're starting to see governments legislate around this. Germany just banned certain classes of smart wearable watches for children under a certain age. Um, you know, and so, you know, the younger generation certainly can pick up technologies and move a lot faster than, than I think the older ones. I don't understand half of it and I'm not that old. But they just, it's intuitive, right? It's, it's just your learning curves faster. You just adopt things faster because it's cool, because it's fun, because you have that time in a lot of cases yeah. uh, that you just don't have when you're, you know, when you, know you, have, you have kids yourself. Um, and I think there's a lot of companies that have targeted that younger segment to uh, plan out their business cases, but now they need to start thinking, start thinking more than that to kind of hit the real mass market and the real ROI. I think the, the low-hanging fruit of the, the beginnings of something like a Facebook is, is gone at this point. So they have to kind of think, how do I get the technology in their hands into a wider market, into an older generation? Uh, and that's influencing a whole lot of things. I mean, from software to hardware to everything else. And then don't we also have to think about this generation to be incentivized or encouraged to want to think about how do they think of the solutions we need to bring to market? So not only getting the products in their hands, but don't they have to be this next generation that develops these great products that we want to encourage them for both the guys and the girls? That's right. Um, and, I, and one thing that's actually really going on in technology that, that kind of really hit last year and is going to keep going this year is just kind of the inclusion factor of the technology um, in demographics, in gender, in, in geography. And, and so companies are taking a much like wider lens on how their technology impacts people, who it's targeted to, and, and, and you know what their responses are going to be to that technology. And the same kind of message and marketing and product design is not necessarily suitable for North America as it is for certain parts of Asia. It's not necessarily suitable for men and women or old and young. And so they're trying to take a more holistic view on how do they cater to the individual over time and make them feel included in this process. And that's a, a very kind of squishy topic that I just kind of entered there, but it is it's impacting hard, right? our customers. It's, it's, it's very hard. It's a hard, hard thing because it's very hard. when we talk about a global solution, you can't really do that, right? I mean, it gets a little, it's a sticky wicket to try to figure out how do you develop a product that's all inclusive? That's right. You know, when you have countries that view things a certain way and you're talking about trying to make a global product, yep. but we have to think about that now. We really have to think about those things. Well, Daniel, I loved having you again. Thank you for sticking Thank you, around. Peggy. I know you're, you need to run. But this is the Peggy Smedley Show. I want you to tweet at us at ConnectedWMag. Remember, we will be back here tomorrow at 10 a.m., continuing our last day here at CES. We've been here all week, and it has been great. So we want to thank you for watching. And remember, we're normally broadcast every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Central, so I hope you continue listening to us. But we've enjoyed it. This is the Peggy Smedley Show, the podcasting voice of IoT and relevant technology. And remember, again, with great technology comes great responsibility. Thanks for watching.